Just when you thought the conference realignment news was simmering down and we could just focus on the 2022 season, Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports dropped a piece the other day that said the Big Ten is evaluating four Pac-12 schools. Not targeting, evaluating. And also, uh, did I leave another coach off of the list of guys who have got pressure or a little warm seat on them this year? Maybe. Maybe not. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe wherever you're listening to or watching the show. I appreciate everybody out there who has done so already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Sometimes you just want to have a nice, quiet week and not have to theorize about the uh, potential demise of the conference that, uh, that you cover here on the show. But I uh, don't have that luxury at this point in time because we have got a recent report out from uh, Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports. You can check it out at cbssports.com. And uh, I'm going to repeat that name several times because sometimes people get uh, a little hot and bothered when they think that I'm just speculating about, oh, the Big Ten wouldn't want this. The Big Ten wouldn't do that. They wouldn't want this team or that team. Like, well, Here's a legitimate college football reporter who's saying that the Big Ten is evaluating Stanford, Cal, Oregon, and Washington to add to the Big Ten. The verbiage here is very important to pay attention to. They are evaluating those four schools. They are not targeting them. They are evaluating. What that means is this is a one-sided situation for the time being because it means the conference is looking at the schools and all the factors that they have going into whether or not they want to add a team or a group of teams in this instance to their conference but there are not ongoing discussions between these schools at least at this point in time as I record this uh, just before noon mountain time on Thursday July 28th episode dropping on the 29th of July a Friday the season is ever closer, and I cannot wait, but uh, got to discuss this sort of stuff. Kevin Warren, the Big Ten commissioner, who I think has been very smart throughout this entire process of realignment and speculation and such, has you know made it clear they're not targeting but evaluating. He said, quote, we're not in the market, but we're always looking for what makes sense with regards to expansion. He said, quote, we will not expand just to expand and used the word strategic when talking about the moves. Now, the other thing, I think those are very real perspectives uh, from from the Big Ten and how they're approaching the these potential expansion moves. Uh, what I think is a little bit of commissioner speak that he also noted is that academics is the number one consideration. Uh, and, you know, all of these four schools, Oregon, Washington, Stanford, and Cal are AAU schools, which is a, an academic alliance that uh, colleges and universities are part of across the country. Um, I, I don't think academics are driving the bus here, but they are clearly a factor um, because I don't know why else you would put Cal in that mix other than the fact that they're an academic power. But he said they're looking at things, you know, with real, with regards to uh, their their academic reputation, their athletic power, uh, you know, media markets, fan base, all that sort of stuff is is playing into. And of course, the unspoken one is uh, is money. And the money is interesting, which I'll get to here in uh, in just a moment. But why would they look at these four schools, right? Why would the Big Ten be evaluating these four institutions to potentially add to their conference uh, when when the new media rights deals expire and then the new ones uh, kick into place? And also the Big Ten and the Pac-12 right now are actively negotiating their next round of uh, media rights deals. And the Big Ten's is going to be re ridiculously <laughs> big. It is going to be um, buku bucks, as the young kids say. 
I think when you look at Stanford, they bring a couple things to the table. Number one, they are certainly an academic power. They have the strongest brand in that sense in in the Pac-12, I would say. Berkeley is uh, a number two. But they can also be very good at football. But according to this report from Dennis Dodd, the other thing that they could bring is an allure for Notre Dame. And Notre Dame should be who the Big Ten wants if they're seeking expansion and value added from a, a, a new school and not adding schools just to add schools, like Kevin Warren said. Notre Dame should be valued above any of these four. There, you you cannot undersell the history, tradition, and financial impact uh, of Notre Dame in addition to them being a, a perennial 10-win team uh, or, or more in college football, and they've been to the playoff a couple times, like Notre Dame should be number one. But if the Irish right now are you know kind of on the fence about wanting to join and the Big Ten wants them and Stanford could be someone you know who Notre Dame has a history and rivalry with, they play every year, then that could be a, a reason for them to, to want to add the Cardinal, the Big Ten, that is. Cal, doesn't bring a lot to the table academically. I think if you put them in the Big Ten, they would be down there with Indiana, Rutgers, like just not not good very often because they haven't been good very often in the Pac-12 and the Big Ten is unquestionably tougher and, and deeper than uh, our beloved Conference of Champions. But they're certainly an academic power. So in that sense, they do fit the mold. And then if Stanford is really your major target there, you'd want them to have a travel partner. You want to expand your West Coast footprint as much as you can if you're trying to, uh, you know, go truly national there. And and so that, I think, is why, why Cal is uh, in the fold. Oregon, I think, brings the strongest football reputation of any of these four, at least in the past 10 years or so. If you want to go back 30, then uh, you might look at Washington, who have a you know shared national championship in uh, 1991, and they're the only one of these four who, who have that. But in the past 10, 15 years, Oregon has has won more games and been consistently at a high level, more so than any of these schools. Stanford, of course, is close and has been uh, a team that can win 10 years or 10 games. They did so uh, six of seven years with uh, Harbaugh and David Schaub. They won 10 or more games, but they're they're down right now as, as a football program, but still they have uh, some allure on the field in that sense because, I mean, they've beaten Big Ten teams in Rose Bowls before. They've won uh, a couple Rose Bowls under David Shaw, so the Big Ten, I think, is aware of what they're capable of being on the football field. Uh, Washington, I think the number one thing they bring to the table, uh, they are the most recent team who've gotten to the college football playoff, but they're also in a state of uh, somewhat rebuilding as as a team right now. And, and then they've got a new head coach who, you know, we've been talking about here on the show, seems to have things moving in the right direction on uh, the recruiting front. We'll see what happens once they actually take the field this fall. Uh, but they bring the Seattle media market. And you might have more overall people in the Bay Area, but I think you know, one of the things that Kevin Warren said they're looking at when uh, evaluating potential new member schools of the Big Ten is what's your fan base like and what's kind of the, you know, uh, alumni and donor base like. And I think on the whole, Washington values football a little more than Stanford does. Not that the Cardinal don't care, but I, I think the fans are certainly more passionate and engaged up in Seattle. You've got a huge media market that you can try and tap into there uh, to bring to the Big Ten. So I, I think that's what each of those four bring into the fold. And, and it makes sense that those would be the ones that uh, th- that the Big Ten would, would go after in, uh, in that sense. The financials of this are where it gets potentially tricky for both sides, which I'll talk about after I tell you about Bet Online, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, oh, uh, go Mariners, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. The financials of this are where it gets. Kind of tricky, but also simplified at the same time. Uh, So uh, let me explain. The Pac-12 reportedly in their new media rights deal are looking at payouts to their schools if it remains as the Pac-10 with everybody who's still, you know, currently committed to the Conference of Champions 
at 21 to $30 million. That is going to be way, I mean way below what the Big Ten is going to be able to offer. Now, the other thing that, that is talked about in this piece uh, from Dennis Dodd is that the Big Ten would negotiate this deal before they would think about adding these schools and that on a per team basis, adding four of them is not going to add a, a value financially because each school does not bring enough to the table. And so the four pack schools that would go to the Big Ten would have to probably be willing to take less than the other member institutions of the Big Ten receive as part of the revenue distribution that come from uh, the media rights deal. Now, I, I, two thoughts on this. Number one, it's weird that Oregon, Washington, Stanford, I understand Cal, but that those three don't bring as much as Rutgers, Maryland, Indiana, or Illinois does, doesn't sound right to me, but I, I be honest, I don't have the data to back that up. I'm just saying those are not huge states with gigantic media markets, nor do they have uh, rich football traditions, uh, especially in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. But I don't think this would stop the Pac-12, right? It would be something that would catch their attention, and they would certainly advocate for getting as much as every other school. But then you might have, have issues with other other teams in your conference saying like, well, we didn't want to add them. You want to add them. And they're going to bring down the amount that we're going to get in this new media rights deal. And we don't really like that. And so Kevin Warren would then probably have to go to the Pac-12 schools or former if this uh, were to actually play itself out one day. He would have to go to them and say, you're going to have to take less, which sounds like it would t maybe turn them away because that's, you know, one of the reasons they would want to go to the Big Ten uh, in addition to the, the stability standpoint. Right. None of these schools like being in limbo. Right. No, nobody likes not knowing what their conference is, uh, what conference they are going to be a part of in uh, in the future. So I think that the stability would actually be stronger than the lesser amount of money because less money in the Big Ten is still more money than what you would get in, in a new Pac-10 or even if they were to expand with Mountain West schools, uh, a new Pac-12. So that's why the Pac-12 schools would, uh, I'm sure they would lobby for it, but if they were ultimately told, no, you're going to have to just make do, at least for the time being, with, uh, with taking less money, then I think they'd be okay with that because there, there's still a lot more money in play here in the Big Ten than in the Pac-10 uh, going forward. If those four were to get offers, I think they would all say yes, right? Remember, this is a this is a one-sided deal. This is the Big Ten evaluating those four, not making offers in discussions. These things are not actively being worked out. This is just what would be, you know, uh, talked about and discussed and speculated should the Big Ten decide to go forward with it. But the Big Ten still holds all the cards here. If they make an offer to any of those four schools or all of them, they will all say yes in a heartbeat. There, there is no way. I cannot foresee any of them saying no. But the Big Ten doesn't have to do that, right? They have to consider, and that's what they're doing right now, weighing their options, whether or not the value added uh, of Oregon, Washington, Stanford, and Cal is, is worth the I guess clout you would pick up as the first super conference, the geographical reach and, and the new markets that you'd be tapping into specifically Seattle and the Bay area, since Oregon is in Eugene and not a, a huge, huge media market there. In fact, a, a somewhat small one, but they also have the, the highest potential ceiling as, as a football program. They've won the most games of any of the four in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And they've got a couple of conference championships too. But the Big Ten would have to, to weigh in, weigh whether or not it's worth adding that to get that reputation and whether that's worth it and being the first conference to get 20 schools and having a national reach and uh, being potentially the strongest, deepest conference and, and such with the fact that if you bring them in, your revenue payouts to, to each member institution would be a little bit lessened because they don't actually bring in the value that uh, that would increase the payouts or at least keep them the same. So all of that is uh, it is still up in the air. Uh, another thing that's worthy of note that was in this uh, same article is that the Arizona Big 12 rumors have been uh, pretty they they've been toasty, shall we say, heating up uh, uh, such. They've been all over the place. However, 
I, I thought that if Arizona were to go to the Big 12 or be wanting to, that Arizona State would want to follow it. That's apparently not the case. So you could run into like a Florida, Florida State situation where one school is in one conference and one school is in another, even though they're they're in the same state. Um, but right now, it's just it's seemingly not a surefire deal that if Arizona, who's uh, shown to be pretty interested in the Big 12 if they were to go that Arizona State would definitely follow um, but I, I think I'll, and I'll close on this uh, this piece here breaking it down with this if you lose four if you were to lose these four teams you'd have six remaining and I don't know how you convince them to stay I, I mean a Mountain West merger I don't think that's enough those four leave I think Arizona would bolt I think Arizona State would start to look at it and think of it as a more enticing option. Uh, And and I think you'd be looking at, you know, maybe maybe the Mountain West would dissolve into the Pac-12 and uh, that's what you'd be dealing with on on the West Coast. But I I think you'd be really hard pressed to keep the remaining six intact, all of them at at least. Um, I think Oregon State, Washington State and, you know, apparently maybe ASU uh, would be willing to stick around. But the other ones. I, I think they would really, really start to consider uh, leaving the, the, the pack, whatever that number would be, uh, should this come to pass. But again, these are not ongoing conversations. It's very, language is very, very important, important here. It's why I've been stressing it. The Big Ten is evaluating them, but they have not made any offers. They have not made phone calls from uh, from what we can see and what's been reported right now. And this is Thursday, July 28th. I'm uh, recording this show. But the Big Ten is evaluating those four, and I, I think there's some there's some logic to it there, but conditions would have to be met, and the Big Ten is looking at it, and we'll continue to monitor it here on the show. Okay, question came in uh, via the Twitter mentions, which you can do as well. You can uh, hop in to uh, the direct messages or just at me at LO underscore Pac-12 or at Smalls underscore 55. You can also hop in the YouTube comments or tweet with the hashtag AskLOP12. And uh, this one comes in from Chris Browning, a Colorado fan. He says, love the show. Thank you, Chris. As a Colorado fan, doesn't Carl Durrell have at least a warm seat? From a fan's perspective, I love him as a man, but he's lost a lot of players to the portal and hasn't been competitive. I like some of the assistant hires, so hoping they can at least put up a fight. The base is getting pretty restless. I don't blame you for being pretty restless because Colorado has just not won consistently in the Pac-12. There's no other way to see it. That's the objective fact. They've had two winning seasons. One of them, they got to the Pac-12 championship game, 10 wins. That was kind of the high point with Mike McIntyre. Then it fell back a little, and then they started really well, and then they had a six-game losing streak, and then he was uh, relieved of his duties as Colorado's head coach. The reason I didn't have Carl Durrell on, on my list of coaches who were under pressure or on a warm or hot seat going into 2022 is I think that depending on how this year plays out, it'll be a more pressing matter in 2023 because they revamped the coaching staff uh, this year around him. And you're right. He did lose a lot of players to the portal. That's a problem. Brendan Rice and Makai Blackman and Christian Gonzalez and Jarek Broussard. Those are tangible losses that, that, that are going to sting this season, particularly for a coach that comes from the defensive side of the ball, losing those players uh, to other Pac-12 schools is a really bad place to be as a program. It's not like they, you know, decided to play their final year elsewhere. You know, I mean, these are guys who who should have been developmental pieces on the defensive or offensive side and who should have been featured players this year. And instead, they decided they wanted to go elsewhere because they felt it was a, a place where they had a better chance to compete for a conference championship and showcase their talents maybe for uh, the next level. I think Gonzalez has got a really good shot to, to play a year at Oregon, maybe two, but probably one, and, and then go to the NFL. But again, it's not good that you're losing good players to the transfer portal. I agree. The recruiting has been Kind of what you would expect at, at Colorado. It's not a place where you're going to bring in big time recruits. You're not in uh, a major metropolitan area that has a, a ton of talent. There are some good players in the state of Colorado, to be sure, but it's not, uh, you know, a, a Washington or a California, Arizona, Texas, Florida. You know, these states that just have a, a litany of guys. I think Colorado is kind of a a poor man's version of the state of Utah, which is that. They have some decent players, but it's just not in abundance. And it's not enough to be able to, you know, just go into your backyard and bring in players who are going to allow you to compete at a high level. 
I, I, I don't think he's on a warm seat. I'd, I'd maybe call it lukewarm, uh, but I definitely wouldn't put it at, at a warm spot. Um, you know, one of the things that, that factors in here is something I discussed with regards to David Shaw and how hot his seat is, and that's how the administration views the football program and, and what their expectations are. In one and a half years, Carl Durrell is 8-10 and 10 as Colorado's head coach. They lost a bunch of players to the portal. I don't take into account the 2020 season at all, really. It's just, I, I, I don't know what it was, but I know it was really, really different from 2021. And it's not surprising to me that Stanford and Colorado, who won a combined seven games in 2021, in that 2020 season, both were over 500. That's not a coincidence to me. Like, it was just weird. Things were set up in a very strange fashion. And and so it's hard for me to take that into account. But I I suspect that all of these college athletic administrations factored in more. And that was a 4-1 and start. And then Colorado lost the Alamo Bowl. So they might be looking at that and saying, like, "Ah, that's a solid season. And, yeah, they were down last year. But, uh, but you know, that's that's still something that they have to factor in when considering how he's performing as uh, the football coach. I think what they're doing with with hiring the new staff is the opposite of what uh, of what Arizona State is doing. And I, I think that I talked with Richie Bradshaw, host of Locked on Sun Devils. You want to find out stuff about Arizona State, go check him out on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. He does a really, really good job. And he's very, very honest as well. And I was talking to him not that long ago, and he said uh, in response to a question I asked him, which was, Herm Edwards, why is he still the head coach? And he said, I think he's there as a scapegoat for if the 2022 season goes off the rails. And they completely revamped their assistant hires uh, in a similar fashion to Colorado, but he sees it as Herm is the top guy, and they they make all these changes, and then if it doesn't go well, they, they'll say Herm is the problem, and... Uh, and then they'll move on. I don't think that's what Colorado is doing here. Uh, they hired Mike Sanford, who, again, I like that hire, from uh, Minnesota. He, he comes over after having won several games as the OC and quarterbacks coach with uh, P.J. Fleck up there. So maybe he'll be able to make a difference. But I don't see that as something where they're expecting, with, with J.T. Shrout and Brendan Lewis you know, kind of battling it out for the quarterback position, Um, I I don't think they expect it to be a one-year turnaround offensively. You need to see improvement with a new offensive coordinator for sure. But I think when you revamp the staff the way that Colorado has, I I don't think they're doing it the same way that ASU is. I think they're going to give Durrell a chance. Now, I didn't love the Carl Durrell hire at the time. I have a feeling I'll be proven right about that in a year or two. And that Colorado fans, as he said, they're getting restless and are are sensing the same sort of thing that, that I see, which is, I just don't know if he brings enough to the table to consistently win football games as a head coach. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that if this season goes poorly for the buffs, which I suspect it will, that they will move on. I think they'll give him another year and see if he can start to make a progression with the new staff. I I think that that's the way they view it. It's, it's just a sense, right? That's just kind of my instinct based on how the program has, has been for the last several years. They did fire Mike McIntyre after back-to-back losing seasons that came off of a really good season, uh, you know, when they got to the championship game. But then he went 5-7, and seven, then 5-0, and oh, six-game losing streak, and he's gone. If Darrell comes out and loses six, seven games in a row to start the year, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll probably fire him on the spot and maybe promote Sanford to being the interim head coach or, or, or something. I don't know. But I feel like the, the coaching revamp on the staff is them – wanting to to give it a chance to build and the quotes and everything I've read about Colorado and what the coaches say how they view the roster and everything I I think they understand that this is not going to be a a one-year turnaround you have to you know kind of break it down or uh, tear it down to the, the the foundation and then build it up again and there seems to be an understanding of that So I don't see him as having a super, super hot seat. Again, I'll call it lukewarm, but I don't think it'll be really hot. I mean, even if Colorado goes two and 10 or three and nine this year, I think they'll give it another season if they show improvement next year and you start to take some steps forward as a football team, then, you know, they'll see it as the process working. I think they're playing the long game here. Um, So unless it goes just atrociously this year, you know, they lose six or seven uh, of their first 
six or seven games uh, and they're just not close and they're not competitive, then I could see them making a change. But I think they're they're in it for the long haul and they're going to they're going to give him a real shot. But keep the questions coming. Twitter, YouTube comments, DMs, Twitter mentions, whatever. Uh, This uh, next week will be the last week that I am uh, recording episodes live, so to speak, as in the day before. Uh, So if you want to get a question answered because I'm going to go on vacation for a couple weeks, make sure you ask me and I'll answer it here on the show. Also be talking about Pac-12 Media Days, which are happening maybe as you're listening to this. Maybe they've already happened. Depends on when you listen or watch. But I appreciate everyone consuming it however or whenever you are doing so. I will see you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.